beautiful watchers to Lost in Adaptation, where we take a look at the various changes and choices made between pages and screen. Today's subject, a childhood favourite of many, including yours truly, the never-ending story. In order to gauge how much I should assume you guys already know about this, I asked a control group of friends if they had seen the film and or read the book, and the results were... Okie dokie, I'm going to be assuming that no one's read the book. If you have my bad, then either way, spoiler warning. The Neverending Story, or Die Unendli Gustiste, was originally written in German by author Michael End, and 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 who incidentally hated the film with a burning passion. I should let you know early on that Atreides' quest and Bastian's eventual intervention only take up the first half of the book, with a very different follow-up story being covered in the remaining chapters. What's that you say? Well, that makes sense, Dom, you sexy bastard. They probably covered that in the sequels. Alas, no. While the second film made some token effort to include references to the book, they still change it so much it bears only a passing resemblance to it, and the third film went so completely off the rails I can only assume the writers were smoking a never-ending doobie while they worked. But I'm thinking anyone who actually watched them probably already guessed that the movies went off and did their own thing. I mean, can you imagine how that would have read? Oh, careful. Watch the leaves. Ich wüsste, Jack Black wunder einer maschiva Arschloch und schießen die Bibliothek und Scheiße. Die Feierbälle hocken den Flag an ein jüdischen Baum. So, it seems we must rely almost entirely on the first film for... The film does a pretty impressive job of sticking to the book's story. Both versions star a very young boy named Mashin, who is suffering from the triple bad luck whammy of recently losing his mother, the poor parenting of a good-natured but emotionally detached father, and the cruel mistreatments of the local school bullies. In an attempt to escape them, he happens to hide in an old bookshop and half-inches a book titled The Neverending Story. He then sequesters himself away in a locked attic in his school to enjoy it. He reads about a magical land of unusual and massively varied creatures that is slowly being eaten away by and being turned into the nothing. To the film's credit, it does a pretty good job of attempting to visualise the invisible. I can't help but feel that End kind of wrote himself into a corner when he put himself in a position to have to describe something that isn't there. The ruler, and or god of the world, who is simply known as the childlike empress, has fallen ill and there seems to be some link between this and the apocalypse. For reasons known only to her, she chooses a ten-year-old boy named Atreyu to embark on a quest to find a cure. Her Atreyu and his horse Artax bounce around the world getting hints and pointers from ancient and mystical creatures and magical oracles, all the while facing tests of his bravery and self-worth. He teams up with a luck dragon named Falcor, who replaces Artax after he traumatizes our childhoods and is helped by some little gnomes in a verbally abusive marriage. There's no fool like an old fool. Wait! Stay here! The observatory! To the winch, wench! <laughs> Hang on a second, I'm just adding find reason to yell to the winch, wench at someone to my bucket list. Eventually, the Tremeister learns that the Empress needs to be given a new name by a human in order to be cured. Unable to find one, he returns to the Empress to admit his failure. She then reveals that she knew what the cure was all along, and his quest was actually intended to attract the attention of a human who was reading about it right now, blah blah blah, meta meta meta. Incidentally, when I first saw this as a kid, I assumed from watching this scene... What a shame they don't ask me. My mother. She had such a wonderful name. That Bastion gave the Empress his mother's name. However, if you listen closely, you can just about make out the words <laughs> which is the name he gives her in the book. Man, his mother had a weird name. Anyway, Bastion gives Moon Child her new name and saves the world. The end of the film, but not the book, which conveniently leads us to. Holy crap, did you know the horse could talk? I mean, it's not a big deal, but it really threw me off when I read it. I mean, can you imagine how different that scene would have been? I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Ah, now I get why they changed that. There really is something gut-wrenchingly heartbreaking about seeing animals suffer, more so even than people sometimes. It's their trusting innocence and loyalty or something. Humanizing Artax by making him talk would probably have subtracted from that. And hey, remember the Rockbiter's good, strong hand speech? Not in the book. The Rockbiter, whose real name is Pjorn Krakzark, believe it or not, only has a brief appearance at the start and is never seen again. People hate on the movie for replacing a tree with a little white kid, but technically he wasn't supposed to look like a Native American either. His people's customs were just similar. A tree was actually rocking a green skin, blue hair look. The movie apparently felt the need to change a few names for, as far as I can see, no real reason. The magical world is meant to be called Fantastica rather than Fantasia, and it's Bastian Balthasar books in the books. 
I know it's spelt Bucks, but it's Books. They say it in the first chapter that it's fitting that he's called Books because he loves to read books. His, his name's Books. Bastian is also kind of an unlikable douchebag and massive pansy in the book. He's actually too much of a steaming pile of wuss to say the Empress's name even as Fantastica falls apart around her and the Empress kind of has to force him into it by throwing both their worlds into an infinite loop until he has no choice. Huh. At this point, I'm actually leaning towards the film being better than the book. Shut up, hipsters. It's rare, but it happens. The two most iconic scenes were either done better in the film or were just in the film, their Bastion's more likeable, and you just can't put an epic theme tune in a book. Well, that's going to be stuck in my head forever. Anyway, let's see what they missed out on in... The book says that the geography of Fantastica changes depending on the subconscious intentions of the person travelling through it. Meaning, if you wanted to go somewhere, you would just have to set out in a random direction, and if you really wanted to get there, you would. However, if you secretly wanted to arrive somewhere else, you'd end up there instead. This, I think, could have some rather... informative side effects. Nah, baby, I'm really looking forward to spending the evening with your mother. Yes, I do know she's really into cross-stitching now. I should be there soon, I've been walking for about an hour. I... Okay, here's the fun bit. As I mentioned before, the film only covered the first half of the book, and as it turns out, that's a damn shame, and is also the reason that End hated it so much. Unlike in the movie, Fantastica doesn't immediately spring back into existence when the childlike Empress has given her name. Instead, Bastion is given the task of rebuilding it piece by piece, because it turns out in Fantastica, humans have the ability to make everything they wish for not only instantly become true, but retroactively always have been true. The process, however, erases something from his memory with every wish. Bastion does an excellent job of rebuilding Fantastica in all its glory, and even improves on it in places. He then, somewhat unsurprisingly, considering he is a ten-year-old boy who has been given the ultimate power to change himself and the world around him as he pleases, proceeds to go balls to the walls batshit mad with power. His ego is fed by the admiration of his followers, so he keeps on creating more and more dangerous monsters and scenarios that give him a chance to be the hero he always wanted to be. As you can imagine, after a while this starts to cause some serious collateral damage. He teams up with an evil witch queen, banishes his new best friend Atreyu for trying to talk sense into him, an army of loyal followers flock to him, and he marches on the ivory tower to usurp the childlike empress and crown himself ruler of all Fantastica. Atreyu is forced to raise an army of loyal Fantasticans in open rebellion. The battle that ensues is made of undiluted weapons grade awesome. Rock biters fight iron giants, eagles fight dragons, light magic fights dark, magical creatures on both sides fight to the death until the streets run wet with blood and the ivory tower burns to the ground. Atreyu fights his way to the top of the crumbling walls and he and Bastion duel with swords Atreyu hesitates and Bastion stabs him in the fucking chest! Fuck me, this shit got dark! I love it! Man, do I wish they'd put this stuff in the movie. I mean, sure, it might have costed its U rating, but I'd probably consider this one of the deepest kids' movies of all time if they'd gone on to show Bastion's fall to the dark side after the happy ending. The end of the book chronicles Bastion's fall from power and his lonely travel seeking redemption for his actions. It's deep, but it's also pretty weird as the places he visits are pretty surreal, like a village run by a monkey that serves as an insane asylum, a coastal town with a hive mind, kind of like the board collective if they were all chilled out hippies, and a mine where a blind old man digs up glass paintings of people's forgotten dreams. He he eventually discovers that the only way he can return to the human world is by finishing every story that he started in Fantastica, but with no memory and no wishes left, he can never do so. Despite everything that happened, a recovered Atreyu turns up, and he and Falcor agree to finish everything for him so that he can go home. Bastion returns to Earth, a greatly improved person, but alas, Sans Dragon, and Atreyu and Falcor presumably spend the rest of their lives cleaning up the messes he left behind. The Dom's final thoughts. Okay, maybe the film wasn't better than the book after all. For one thing, it made me consider the question, is half a never-ending story still a never-ending story? Ha! <laughs> Maths. I totally understand why the author was pissed off. He wrote a story about someone who saved a world and then completely fucked it up. Then the filmmakers came along and decided they could just pick and choose the elements of the story they liked. It's kind of like someone making a Romeo and Juliet movie and ending at the point where they get married, it would entirely change the fundamental nature of the narrative. Knowing this isn't going to stop me loving the film, as I don't see why being a betrayal of the original source material and being a great movie has to be mutually exclusive. But hey, I've just had a great idea. Hey Hollywood, you know how you're going through this fetish at the moment where you reboot everything with a darker edge to it so that it'll appeal to a more modern audience? Perfect candidate! The Dom would eventually take his idea to Hollywood, but it turned out Leonardo DiCaprio beat him to it and stabbed him in the face to avoid competition. But that's another story. Wait, what?
say my name. You're goddamn right. <laughs>